Let me reiterate, I'm a software engineer. I'm not an AI guy, so don't expect a technically deep talk on, on AI. Rather, I will try to frame a little bit what's going on in software engineering and the interaction between AI and software engineering, uh, mostly highlighting some results and challenges. And uh, I will mostly refer as in the title to generative uh, AI, because I think it is generative AI that is having sort of transformation, transformational effect. On, on what we are doing in software engineering. Okay, so uh, not sure if uh, you agree with this, but I think I can easily convince you that gener generative tasks, different kinds of generative tasks are everywhere in software engineering. Uh, for instance, in, if we consider a standard development process, we start with writing some requirements and we are used out of these requirements to write, generate some design documents, design models. We do write and generate code out, out of these requirements and, and, and models. Uh, we actually write documentation and we, we write test cases from documentation and code. And this is usually reviewed by some stakeholders and this iterates. So let's say already in a standard development process, there are a number of activities which are actually generative tasks, usually performed, let's say, by, by humans. And the, the, the story doesn't only go in this direction, but it works in many different di directions and combinations, right? You can generate documentation, or you may want to generate some documentation out of tests or out of code, or you may want to reverse engineer models, requirements, or again, you, you can even jump between the different phases. So it's kind of context where we face a number of uh, generative tasks, and this is why generative AI is particularly appealing, because we have a number of opportunities in terms of applications and challenges. And this is having a sort of deep impact on what we are doing in software engineering. Just to give you some numbers and uh, um, an idea about this, uh, if we go back to our, let's say, flagship conference, the International Conference on Software Engineering, up to six years ago, and we check the, the program there, uh, there were no sessions about AI and software engineering, the interaction between these two, two topics. And if we consider this year conference, uh, I could um, identify at least one third of the sessions just dedicated to this topic. Quite easily another 8% of the paper just from the title are also related to this topic and this without even considering the content of, of the paper. So I do believe that more than half of the papers are studying the interaction and apply AI to number of diverse software engineering tasks. So this is having sort of, I mean, this technology is having sort of deep impact on the way we are uh, working on the development or will be working likely in the future in the development of the software. So why is so much interest in, I mean, AI, generative AI and software engineering? Well, that's uh, quite, in a sense, easy to understand. The problem is, is that we could maybe automate or semi-automate a number of tasks that now, nowadays we do and are non-trivial, quite complex. Sometimes they are resource intensive. They could be time consuming, even repetitive. And this could be kind of delegated to some AI or generative AI doing the job for us, and we could focus on the most challenging, interesting part of, this, uh, of these tasks. So this is kind of a uh, promise or vision that, that, that we have and we would like to achieve. And then just to make a few examples, this applies to a number of tasks and activities, and we could do this in a number of ways in software considering various software engineering tasks spanning the full life cycle. So, for instance, if we consider the domain of requirements uh, engineering, so uh, eliciting, writing, specifying requirements, uh, what we do nowadays is performing a number of uh, time-consuming tasks, like interviewing, interacting with stakeholders in order to obtain the requirements. And again, the promise is that out of additional set of requirements, we could maybe delegate this task and partially delegate this task to AI, to an AI that may suggest additional requirements out of an additional set of requirements that we may have uh, elicited. So in this case, really boosting the effectiveness of, or potentially boosting the effectiveness of 
requirement solicitation. And again, about requirements, there are yet a number of applications. For instance, usually we have to assess the requirements documents. We, we have to identify uh, issues. We have to uh, improve uh, the documents according to a number of uh, quality criteria. And again, this could be done potentially with the help of a uh, of an AI, as well as assessing the impact of changes in the requirements, how these imply generating and changing the artifacts that, that we have. All those are quite complicated and time-consuming activities that potentially could be performed in the future with the interaction and the help of, of an AI. And this is not, this is just about requirements, but we, uh, we already had a, a talk to get today about code generation and indeed uh, there are a number of opportunities there. Uh, writing code is one of the um, I mean, main tasks software developers are doing. And again, we do have the opportunity, and which is something we already do, like generating the code, exploiting a number of diverse inputs, like requirements, tests, comments, or uh, checking how to evolve the, uh, the code. And finally, just to make another Example, in the domain of software quality and testing, we do generate uh, test cases to validate our uh, software. Once we identify a failure, we need to understand what the fault is that caused a failure and repair a program. All those activities could be quite complicated and time consuming. And again, here, I mean, AI can really help us generating the test and automating or partially automating all these, uh, all these tasks. So, in a sense, we are really moving towards uh, uh, a vision where engineers, software engineers, will regularly interact with some AI to accomplish their task more effectively and, and efficiently. And th this is really what, what most of the, let's say, people in software engineering are, are studying how to do this. But if this is like the vision, so what maybe we would like to achieve in the future, uh, one question is what we are capable of doing right now. So this is what we, we would like to do in, in the future, but uh, what is the status of the research and the practice? How effectively could we do all these activities with the current available uh, technologies? So what I would like to do is just highlight some, let's say, tales from the trenches. So what, what is the status based on some uh, studies that have been uh, published about different kind of uh, tasks. Uh, these studies concern the uh, usability of these, of these tools as well, the capability to generate code and, and test cases. And I would like to uh, use these studies to mention some of the challenges that we uh, we see in the area in order to achieve somehow this, uh, uh, this vision. Okay, so the first one is this study appear, appeared this uh, year, which uh, I think is uh, quite is interesting. The study is based on around uh, 2,000 uh, items collected from GitHub. Those items are uh, either commits, pull requests, or issues, mentioning the use of ChatGPT. Actually, those are about developers explaining how they completed the task, some task using uh, uh, ChatGPT. This, uh, this corpus has been collected and analyzed. And uh, what we, we discovered, uh, not surprising, is that people are already using these tools to, to complete tasks. And uh, there are some classes of tasks that appear more frequently than, uh, than others, like implementing a feature, improving, trying to improve the development process using this task, learning how to solve some problem that maybe someone is not able to, to solve by him or herself, uh, manipulating data or the environment of, of the software, generating tests, or generating documentation. Those are some activities where people are really, I mean, app apparently using this, these tools, but not necessarily the comments report uh, uh, like positive story. I mean, comments may report different kinds of stories about uh, developers interacting with, uh, with these technologies. So let's start with some, let's say, episodic uh, evidence, some positive cases reported uh, in this corpus. For instance, people often report to uh, quite effectively use LLM to achieve uh, language translation or cross-project language uh, translation, to complete cross-project language translation uh, tasks, which where those tools seem to be already quite uh, helpful to simplify this, this task. 
very, com very, com very frequently they are used to generate documentation and descriptions. People use a lot of these tools to generate the comments and, and pull request description in a more practical and efficient way. Uh, I could speculate a little bit that the documentation is usually the kind of artifact you want to be there, but maybe nobody cares much, so maybe it is so successful because you really want the documentation, the comment to be there about the quality, I'm not, not sure. But anyway, people apparently, based on the GitHub discussion, are quite happy with this, this application. And again, in the domain of software quality, they are used to generate test cases or to, to debug the software with some degree of, uh, of success, apparently. But there are also concerns uh, about how this tool uh, performs. For instance, one is about code ownership. Uh, developers wonder about people using these tools to obtain recommendations, for instance, about some code that should be implemented. They're just pushing this code into the repository without a strong understanding of the code that they committed. So not having any more the ownership of the code, which means being able to advocate for the code, argue why the code is correct or, or not. And this sort of uh, possible negative effect of using these tools to, into the development uh, process. There are a number of uh, cases where these tools are reported to uh, accomplish learning tasks. Like you have a problem, you don't know exactly how to solve. And then you try to use this tool to get sort of initial solution you can uh, elaborate more. But here I would say, uh, according to, to the evidence, we are kind of quite unsuccessful because usually the questions are about some new frameworks, new libraries, something new that people don't know. And very frequently uh, in the training set, uh, those models have not the information to provide uh, uh, the correct recommendation to, to the user. And so, I mean, th th there is sort of uh, unclear uh, evidence in this case of their effectiveness. And this relates to the other point that is recommending the precated API. Uh, very often, once you ask for a piece of code, you may get in the, in the code as a recommendation the usage of an API that is now deprecated. Again, because, because the model was trained with a corpus where th that given API was still, uh, still used. And this raises to me sort of the first challenge for, for you. That is uh, apparently our capability to train and retrain these, these models is not uh, strong enough uh, considering how fast technology is moving, how fast libraries are, uh, are evolving and new technologies appear. And so we need a better way to obtain models and AI that are able to provide timely uh, recommendations. Okay, going on, of course, we, we know that those models and tools may generate hallucinations, and that is recommending, if we consider the case of code, recommending using functions that uh, uh, actually don't exist. This happens uh, with a relative frequency. For instance, this is an example of uh, a recommendation where a given library is recommended, QR code, but then the specific function that is used in the code uh, is not a function that exists in the, in the library, actually. And, and uh, this means that, I mean, the developer receiving this recommendation, of course, has to realize that the function is wrong and finding the right function to be used in order to, uh, to write, uh, to implement the correct code. And, and clearly, this could be uh, kind of uh, annoying for the user. But uh, even worse, uh, hallucination may, may generate uh, uh, security concerns and security risks. For instance, if, if the hallucination is about uh, a package, a non-existing package that is recommended to a user to solve the, the current problem, a malicious user could exploit this information to ask about, about this package and how this package is supposed to be installed and then use all this information to implement the package and embed malicious code into the package and make the package available. Next time, this same uh, previously non-existing package will be recommended to a user, at that point the package, the package exists because it has been implemented by a malicious user. And there is a chance that someone will download and use this, uh, this package. So there are a number of concerns, and I would say this one is sort of uh, another challenge dealing with hallucinations and preventing the related security risks. Right now, we don't, probably we don't have a good way of dealing with, uh, with this concern. 
Okay, uh, I would like to say something about the usability uh, using the results from another recent study appeared uh, this year. Uh, this study actually surveys the opinion of more than 400 uh, GitHub contributors who work on AI-related projects. Actually, these contributors use a number of uh, tools like Copilot, uh, Tab9, ChatGPT, and also some tools trained on some proprietary data. And uh, I mean, I will not uh, go through all the findings reported in the uh, in the study, but I will mention some of the usability challenges that have been reported. I think are quite interesting to understand how usable those technologies uh, are. Uh, one challenge I will mention is uh, that are still hard to control. So there are a number of aspects you cannot really control when you interact with, as a developer, when you interact with this tool. For instance, you don't know exactly what part of your code and project is used to provide a recommendation. You may want to know this, especially for the tools acting while embedded in your integrated development environment. So you don't know exactly uh, what's going on, but more relevantly, uh, it's not clear how you can express uh, the result, the, the code or the solution that you want to obtain. So how to manipulate the result providing the proper prompt. And a lot of people uh, report that this could be very expensive. So you ask for some recommendation, then what you get is not exactly what you need, and then you have to iterate, iterate over and over again, making these tools not really usable. And sometimes it's even difficult to really ask or know how to ask for the in the correct way, in the proper way. And so controlling the, the results, how to get, for instance, longer or shorter or different code, or even controlling when to receive the suggestions. So if once we talk about usability, for some tools you have to query the tools, but some others act like uh, uh, integrated in the IDE in a sort of transparent way, deciding when to provide the recommendation. And then again, you, you may want the tool to perform and behave in, uh, in different ways. And then even the interaction, somehow people seem to pretend a richer and richer way of interacting, having sort of dialogue with the, uh, with the AI in order to be a being able to control the, uh, uh, the, the, the result. And not uh, trivially also how to deal with multiple suggestions. Number of these tools that, uh, don't generate a single recommendation, but may generate many recommendations. And then you have to, I mean, pick up one or implement your solution out of this number of recommendations. And again, it's unclear methodologically how to do this effectively. And those are sort of open challenges for the, for the users of this tool. And related to the, to the output, again, it's still hard to uh, assess the result, how to know if a recommendation that I receive is correct. Maybe it's correct, it's the good one, but uh, how difficult it is and how can I assess the correctness of, the, uh, of a recommendation, how to analyze it uh, effectively. So this is also why a number of developers still believe that it is better in, in, in terms of uh, cost effectiveness to write the code or to complete the task uh, themselves rather than asking to some AI and then wasting time asking different ways and checking the result and again asking again entering this this uh, this loop. Uh, IPR is also reported uh, uh, as a concern in the community both in terms of uh, you don't know exactly what happened to the content of the prompt when you ask or something, you may share some information that you don't want to be somehow public or to be digested, in a sense, by, by the model. And on the other end, when you receive the recommendation, you, do, you don't really know if you could use as is whatever you, re, you received as a recommendation. Maybe there is some um, uh, property right to be, um, but, I mean, you will violate some uh, property right by just reusing whatever you receive. And then there is also another aspect that is learning. So usually when you start using these tools, you will write these tools to adapt to your style, your coding style, the way you complete the task, the way you work. And I mean, there is almost or little learning capabilities now uh, available. So enriching this tool with the capability to adapt to the way uh, developers uh, work, that is another uh, important, let's say, usability, uh, usability concern, and those are I would say some of the challenges right now for the, for the community to make this tool useful in practice. 
Uh, and then what about correctness? Those are uh, issues and concern about usability, but how correct are those, uh, those tools? Of course, the results, I mean, vary depending on, on the task. Uh, there is no single answer to this, to this question. But I will pick up some, I will pick up some uh, studies to give uh, an idea uh, of what's, what's, going, what's going on and what is the level of correctness of the recommendations we, uh, we receive right now. Okay, uh, first one, first task I consider is something since quite reasonably simple but non-trivial that is uh, obtaining the implementation, full implementation of a method. So I know the method I want to implement, I know what, uh, what the behavior of the method should be, and then I pretend my assistant to recommend a possibly correct implementation for this, uh, for this method. Uh, I will consider, in this case, two, two studies we recently completed about uh, this aspect uh, in the context of uh, implementing Java methods. Okay, uh, one, uh, in one study we, uh, we used 100 Java methods selected from some uh, relevant GitHub projects for the, for the study. And then we uh, classified the methods we use for this controlled study, depending whether the implementation of the method requires some interaction with other methods. So you can have some code that is self-contained. You can have methods which have dependencies with other methods in the same class. So actually the, the correct implementation interacts and invokes other methods present in the same class or external dependencies. So invocation to methods external to the current class. Just to see if the assistants have different capabilities depending on the, on this, on the presence of these uh, dependencies. Uh, the, the way we, we have done the study is pretty simple. We, so we have taken from the GitHub the method, we removed the method implementation, we preserve the uh, the comment and the rest of the code, and pass these to uh, AI, an AI assistant uh, with a, I mean, using, that uses pre-trained models. At that time of the study, we uh, used Copilot, ChatGPT, Bard, and Tab9. And then we, once we get the generated code, we compare the generated code with the original code that, that we have, the one implemented by the developer, and check whether the recommendation was correct or not. So this is what we have done. Uh, the results that we obtained were not so, in a sense, uh, enthusiastic. I would say less than half of the recommendations were uh, correct. That is uh, significant effort it is still required by the developer to check and fix these, uh, these recommendations. Somehow Copilot uh, worked better than, uh, than the others. Uh, Bard was, I'm sorry for Bard, for the Google people, but maybe Gemini is better, surely better now. Uh, and then it, it was, I mean, the performance of these tools were particularly poor uh, with the external dependent methods. So of course, uh, those are the ones that require more context, more contextual information that is not really available to, to the model. So these ones are really hard to, uh, to be generated for these, for these tools. Uh, and also in terms of, I mean, the relative capabilities of all these uh, uh, assistants. Uh, although Copilot was somehow better than the others, there is no single assistant that subsumed the other. So there were, for some reasons, some methods that could be implemented correctly only by uh, uh, one of these, uh, of these tools. And by the way, here for correctness, uh, since the previous Talk uh, uh, at this mention has been mentioned different ways of checking correctness. So, so what we have done here, we use the test cases available uh, with the project to check the correctness of the resulting code, and then for the ones for the code that passes the test cases, we manually inspected the code to double check it is equivalent to the one implemented by the developer. So it is like correct according to the human uh, judge, judgment in this case. Okay, we also completed another study yet about uh, the correctness of this recommendation. I would like to quickly I mean, summarize. In this case, we used 100 methods selected from GitHub and another 100 selected from LeetCode, which is a repository of, uh, of programming, uh, programming problems. And in, in this study, we focus on the, on the prompt and some features 
of uh, that prompts may have and whether these features have an impact or not on the on the result that, that you obtain. In particular, we consider different ways of asking for the code to be generated, and those are sort of syntactic features. And then we consider different content. So when you ask for a piece of code, you could provide the example or not. You could provide some explanation about the boundary cases or not. You could provide a summary of, the, uh, of what the method is supposed to do. So, uh, and we systematically investigated uh, all the possible way of asking the questions according to this feature. So we generated more than 120,000 prompts uh, asking the same 200 uh, questions. And then we, in this case, we completed this study with uh, using Copilot at the time. So what we, we have found, uh, just to mention in terms of the result in terms of the uh, correlation between the features and the correctness is that the way you ask the question was impacting very little in our study. And we had a statistical significant or mild impact for the presence of summary and, and examples. But going back to the correctness uh, point, uh, again, correctness was quite uh, bad. I mean, 12% of the code generated for the lead code method uh, was correct, and 17% of the GitHub method generated were, uh, were correct. So really low performance in this study. And in this study, correctness means passing all the test cases, which don't imply the method is correct. That could be still uh, false, not captured by the available test cases. There could be security issues, performance issues, not tested by, not discovered by the test cases. Indeed, we expect the correctness to be, the, the real correctness for this code to be below 10% uh, likely. So to me, uh, effectiveness is still a challenge when we pretend to have something that is as big as a single method implemented by this, uh, this tool. So to me, we are not really uh, there uh, yet, based on this uh, on this evidence, and then I mentioned test generation, uh, which is different task. In this case, unit test case generation. People are trying to use indeed these tools to generate test cases for the for the code, and for instance, in one uh, of the studies, uh, the researcher trained a Bart transformer to generate test cases. Uh, the way it was trained, uh, it was first pre-trained on a corpus of English test, then on a corpus of Java code, and finally fine-tuned on the task of generating test cases from a given method. So the input is the method, and the output is the test cases for the, for the method. And they, I mean, have done experiments, and what they found is that the effectiveness is kind of close, but really not yet comparable to the test generators we have. Indeed, I would say, in terms of unit test case generation, we have plenty of tools able to generate the test cases which don't use um, LLMs or generative AI and which are quite good because they are able to generate test cases that exercise all the statements in a given method, for instance. So here, performance is still yet not really comparable. One good point for the test cases generated in this way is their readability. They really look like implemented by a human. They are really uh, readable. While with the tools we had so far to generate test cases, test cases uh, are quite uh, unreadable in terms of the choice of the identifiers and the way the code is written. So this may have an advantage in terms of test maintenance. So still, uh, promising in a, in a sense. Uh, so in terms of effectiveness, uh, we don't know yet. Probably we should have to combine the regular tools to generate test cases with these models to improve the readability of the, of the test. But it's interesting, this aspect of the, of the readability of the test, indeed. Uh, and then I would like to mention one specific uh, uh, final aspect about uh, test case generation, that is assertion generation. Uh, as I said, we have plenty of tools that are able to generate test cases automatically, especially unit test cases, but not only. For instance, the test in the slide is something could be generated automatically by, by a tool, not using uh, LLM. But one of the challenges is how to predict the expected results. So it's easy to generate a test that exercises the software, and then you have some outputs produced by the software. But if you pretend to find the faults present in the software, you need to be able to predict what the result is supposed to be, and then detect a fail. So like in this case, 
The question will be what, should, what the tool should write in the assert equal statement to obtain a correct test case. So far, the, the, this is called the Oracle problem in testing, and so far was, still is, uh, maybe the biggest problem in software testing, the lack of capability to predict the results, if we want to obtain automation in test case generation. And generative AI is super interesting um, because it really has the promise to, I mean, somehow solve this problem. We could use all these models to predict what the result should be for a generated test, achieving in principle, the capability to generate, I mean, the full test cases, both the part that exercises the software and the final uh, assert statement. Uh, people tried to do, uh, to do this already uh, using different kind of models, but I would say, the, again, the correctness, effectiveness of these tools is not, uh, uh, I mean, sufficient yet in the original uh, this is one of the of the attempts, a recent study where we obtained sort of 31% correctness in terms of predicting the assert statement that should be, appear inside a test case. And we, I mean, we are like uh, uh, repeating this study on a new data set in this, uh, in this period, collected, I mean, from, I mean, uh, using tests collected from the wild, in the, in the wild, from, from GitHub, in recent projects. And then this uh, correctness drops to 10%, probably because, again, technology, technology is moving fast, new libraries, components appear, and what was kind of correct up to a few years ago, it doesn't work as effective as it was now with some new, uh, new piece of code. So in a sense, the software community, the testing community is super excited about the possibility to predict the results of test cases. This might have a dramatic impact in terms of our capability to generate the test cases. But according to the current empirical results, again, we are not uh, there, uh, there yet, at least not to uh, move this to sort of, let's say, production. Okay, that was my, I mean, quick, overview of what's going on. So in a sense, generative AI is really sort of a game changer for, for the software engineering community. Really, we have this, uh, I mean, with this possibility to automate a number of tasks that we don't really know how to automate right now, not as, as effective, as practical as it could be with this, using these models. And this is also witnessed by the popularity of the approaches and people investigating how to use AI in the domain of software engineering. But also there are a number of challenges. Some of them, I mean, the list for sure is not complete, but some of, some of them uh, highlighted in the context of this talk, like the fast moving uh, uh, technology that uh, still, models don't really keep the pace with the fast moving technology. Hallucination and the related security risk, how to control both the input, the behavior, and the output generated by these models, solving uh, IPR concern, and making these tools adaptable to the, uh, to the user, to the developer, who would like to, I mean, customize the behavior of these, uh, of these tools. And then, of course, the effectiveness, indeed, uh, uh, we cannot pretend to just simply delegate the task to some AI, some models. Uh, the evidence tells us that, I mean, current models are not precise enough. Indeed, it's necessary to have uh, iteration and, and probably a sort of conversations somehow. But we don't know yet how to handle this effectively. And so this is probably, I mean, another challenge for the future to design how this interaction between the human developers and the AI should take place in order to complete in an I mean, effective way the, the, the tasks that are needed. And I would say very likely in the future, this may scale to the, to the size of the team, like uh, teams might be composed of a mix of developers, AIs with different capabilities, interacting in some ways and according to some models that we, we don't know yet. And, and we will investigate in the, uh, in the future, I think. Okay, so I think this concludes my, my talk and thanks for the attention.